using John 1 as our focus. It's here that we find several people proclaiming Jesus as preeminent. Well, I just want to give you a quick summary. First, you'll, if you were to read that chapter, you'd find John the Baptist. Three times in this chapter, he cried out that Jesus is first and foremost. It was this reminder that for all those who were listening that it wasn't about him, it was about him. In John 1.15, it says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And then verse 27, It is he who coming after me is prefer preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. And then verse 30, This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I can almost hear his voice crying out loudly because he wanted people to see and to know Jesus first and foremost. Then there's John, the author of this gospel, and he talks about Jesus being last, first, last, and always throughout the entire book. In fact, he had so much to say about the preeminence of Christ, he couldn't write it all down. In John 21, 25, it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So passionate was John about putting Jesus first and making sure all attention went to him that chapter 1 is actually written like a daily recording of events. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus. Then John saw Jesus again while standing with two disciples, and then they heard Jesus speak and followed him. And then Jesus turned around, and the next day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and on the third day a wedding took place, and then he went down to Capernaum. These details of daily life recorded by John point to Jesus, keeping him first and foremost while John the Baptist just faded into the background. Then there's Andrew. He was one of the first to follow. And once convinced that Jesus was the one, he immediately went to find his brother, Simon Peter, and he brought him to Jesus. Andrew couldn't stop talking about Jesus, and we know what effect that had on Peter. Then there's Philip, one of the guys that Jesus invited to join him in Galilee. Now, before Philip joined him, he found Nathaniel, and he told him about Jesus. You see, Philip was a guy who simply believed Jesus was the best thing that ever happened to him. Too good to keep to himself, so he had to just go and find someone to tell. All these people, John, John, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, they wanted one thing, Jesus. They wanted Jesus to be first and foremost in their lives and in everyone else's lives, so they talked about him everywhere they went. It's kind of like the preschooler who went to Sunday school for the first time. Her, yeah, you're a preschooler. Her mom couldn't wait to get to her afterwards, hoping she liked it and wanted to go back. When she picked her up, she said, so how did it go? Did you like it? Did you have fun? Did you learn anything? And the little girl thought for a moment and said, oh, yes, Mommy. I liked it a lot, and I had so much fun, but I think my teacher was Jesus' grandma. Her mother, a bit startled, but still smiling, said, what makes you think that? Because she kept showing me pictures of baby Jesus. And then she was showing me pictures of him as he grew up. And that's all she talked about was Jesus, so she must be Jesus' grandma. <laughs> Does that describe us today? Do people know that we're related to Jesus? Are we like this teacher, or John, or John, or Andrew, or Philip, or Nathaniel? Do we want to tell others about Jesus? It seems, to me at least, when we first know Jesus, we're pretty enthusiastic in telling people about him. But then for some reason, we stop after a while. How come? Well, maybe it's because we read somewhere that's not the way to get people to follow Christ. We don't want to scare them off, so don't be too bold and brazen about Jesus. Or maybe it's because... When we're new followers, our faith hasn't yet been cluttered with opinions and perceptions and doubts and unbelief. So we just can't stop ourselves from talking about him. Or maybe it's because in the beginning, we still don't believe that people really don't want to hear about him. We don't think that we think they actually want to hear something about Jesus. And then we find out later that they really don't care. <laughs> And so we let their attitude influence our enthusiasm, and we stop talking about Jesus. 
But you see, that's when we forget that we're the ones who are in relationship with him. We're the ones who know who he is. We're the ones who love him more than life itself. We're the ones who know that he loves everybody, even the unlovable. I think it's interesting we get this way with Jesus because my grandchildren, my children and my grandchildren never lose their importance or their specialness in my life, even if other people aren't interested in them. I will still talk about them with others, and I'm more likely to show pictures of them to people I don't know and people I've met for the first time than I am to other people that I see all the time. So that's what I really want to talk about today in regard to Jesus being first and foremost in life. Do we want to talk about Jesus outside of these walls? I think it's a legitimate question because we talk about lots of wants in life, don't we? We talk about what we want out of life, what we want in life, what we want out of a job, what we want out of a relationship, what we want to do, what we, where we want to go, what we want to look like, and what we want to happen. We actually keep very busy every day fulfilling our wants. Yet we still spend much of life discontented, unhappy, or dissatisfied. Always searching for the next thing that we want to do. Always complaining that we never get to do what we want to do. Or always blaming everyone else from keeping us from doing what we want to do. And I'm talking about wants today because as I read and reread John 1, two words kept popping out in verse 43. It says, Jesus wanted. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. It dawned on me as I kept reading that, how many times I asked Jesus what he wants me to do or what he wants for me or what he wants for others in any given situation, making it sound like I'm interested in what he wants. But in reality, those questions show that I'm more interested in my wants because I'm focused on me, keeping myself first and foremost. The question really isn't, what do you want for me, Jesus? But rather simply, Jesus, what do you want? Leave the for me out of it because adding it only complicates a rather simple question. Let me put it into practical terms. People might ask you, what do you want me to do? Well, most of the time I know what I want, but it has little to do with what you do or what you want to do. I want them to figure out how to make it happen without me having to figure out what I want them to do too. Make sense? Yes or no? I don't want to be in charge of what they do. I just know what I want. And I think we must think it's easier if someone just tells us what they want us to do, but it really isn't. In fact, that's a recipe for disaster because what we want to do is generally different than what others want to do. And so we get these ideas while we're trying to do what they want us to do of what we want to do and bleh, it gets super complicated. And it's much simpler than that. We can know what people want simply by listening to them. And then, instead of asking them what do they want us to do, we'll know what they want and what we can do to help them do what they want. For example, I know at times that my husband would like me just to listen. But I usually complicate it and I want to share my opinion. And then I think, well, what did you want me to do anyway? Just listen and I'll tell you the truth? Which was actually just my perception of truth. Or he tells me that I have to keep my sermon between 15 and 20 minutes, but I preach for 25 minutes. And then I say, well, what did you want me to do? Shorten what Holy Spirit had to say? <laughs> or maybe we want our houses clean and organized, and someone in the house says, well, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to you know, put, away, put things away and clean up. I know, but what do you want me to do? Well, clean up and put stuff away. I know, but exactly what do you want me to do? Nothing. I'll just do it myself. <laughs> Anybody have that scenario happen at home? We know what people want, but when we add ourselves into the equation, it gets muddied. The focus then becomes us and not what they want. I read an article a friend posted on Facebook about her uncle, and he's selling his repair shop. That, that's been in the family for um, decades. And he seems to epitomize this concept of listening and doing what the customer wants. Here's the beginning of it. As Jerry Myers walks through the shop and among the machines at Myers Repair, he can share each one's history as though they are old friends of his. Each machine has a story or two and each has its own quirks. 
Some date back as far as 1919, and each has its special purpose to help the Myers team do what they do best, solve problems. You have to listen to people, Jerry said. You just have to be a good listener, and you have to ask a lot of questions when you're trying to figure out how to help them. This repair guy had it. Just listen and then do. Don't ask what do you want me to do for you. Fix it. <laughs> he knew that. So it is with Jesus. We know what he wants as we read his word, listening to what he has to say and then just doing it. We don't have to ask, so I know what you want, Jesus, but what do you want me to do? In John 1, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. Other versions say that Jesus would go, he decided to go, he purposed to go, he minded to go, he willed to go, or he was determined to go. In the Greek language, Jesus wanting to go to Galilee meant that he was determined to go there because he had a purpose. Jesus' wants always have purpose. Most often we think of wants in terms of just our simple desires, not needs. But that's not how we should view what Jesus wants. Because Jesus' wants are actually needs. When we know what he wants, we need to follow. We don't need to complicate it by asking him what he wants us to do. Knowing what he wants should put a fire in us to want to make his wants happen. Amen? So why did Jesus want to go to Galilee? Why was he so determined to go there? Well, he had to find Philip. It says he found Philip and said to him, follow me. So my question is, what's so special about Philip? Well, Philip would want to listen to Jesus. Philip would want to follow, and Philip would want to share Jesus with others. Verse 45 reads, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip followed without question, immediately telling Nathanael the good news. We found him, yes! Nathanael had a question before he was willing to believe. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> a question like that is likely the reason that we don't go tell everyone out there, we found him, yes! What if they ask us a question we can't answer? Uh, maybe we stop talking about Jesus and inviting people to church because we're afraid of their preconceived notions about what church is. Or we know they've had bad experiences in church, so we don't want to open that Pandora box again. Or maybe we're frustrated with our pastors or our programs or our lack thereof. Or uh, maybe we're ashamed of our church building. You know, it's not up to date. We don't have new carpet. We don't have chairs with cup holders, plush furniture, and a large entryway complete with natural lighting and a coffee bar. Or maybe we just don't think people will come to Jesus. Or maybe people won't come to church anyway, so why bother? However, if we're afraid of hard questions, or if we won't talk about Jesus, or invite people for any of those other reasons, then we're not thinking about what Jesus wants. Philip's answer to Nathaniel's question, can anything good come out of Nazareth, was, come and see. Come and see the one we've heard about our whole lives, the one we've read about in the Law of Moses. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then, together they go. Philip didn't try to convince Nathaniel himself. If he had, he probably went back to Jesus disheartened and said, well, what did you want me to do anyways? He just went and did what Jesus said. Come and see. That's all he had to say. This is the second time this is said in this chapter. The first time was in verses 37 to 39, when John's two disciples asked to see where Jesus lived. And Jesus said, come and see. And when they went and saw, they couldn't help but stay and learn. That's all we need to do, friends. Get excited about Jesus and tell people, come and see. We don't have to convince them ourselves. That's what we're all here for. That's what the church is all about. We, the church, are a body of believers, and we gather in this building, which we also call a church, where people can come and see Jesus so that we can go and tell more people. As Philip and Nathaniel were going to see Jesus, he actually saw them coming. And rather than wait for Nathaniel to get to him, he, Jesus called out to him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite, <clears throat> indeed, in whom is no deceit, this astounded Nathaniel, and he said, how do you know me? 
And Jesus said, I saw you before Philip saw you under the tree. Na 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 na. <laughs> this simple revelation made Nathaniel exclaim, Rabbi, which means teacher, you are the Son of God. Jesus replied something like, Because I said I saw you, you believe in me? Oh, Mansky, you'll see greater things than that. You'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on me. Look what can happen when we know what Jesus wants, when we believe Jesus is first and foremost, when we just invite people to come and see. Jesus will reveal himself to those people. Jesus will reveal things about those people to themselves. Jesus revealed himself as the latter, as the one who opens our eyes to heavenly things. You see, first John followed, then Philip followed, then Nathaniel's eyes were opened. Do you see a pattern here? Do you see a pattern here? We don't need to be so concerned about what Jesus wants for us as much as simply knowing what Jesus wants and then go do it. Jesus is the first and foremost reason for inviting people to church, and he is the only reason people will stay in church. Jesus wanted to, people to follow him then, and Jesus wants people to follow him now. We might be able to attract some people to our churches because of all the stuff, but there will come a time when we'll have to tell them that all the stuff is not the main attraction. Jesus is. And I think we might as well get it right from the start. Tell them to come and see Jesus because he is first and foremost in our lives and everything else comes after him. Tell them that what Jesus wants, Jesus gets and we want what he wants. He wants you, he wants me, and he wants others to know him as their personal Lord and Savior. See, we can either go with the flow of what people want or we could go with the flow of what Jesus wants and teaches in his word. Jesus wanted people to follow him and he gives the invitation to come and see, stay and learn, go and tell. It really is that simple. That uncle of a friend I told you about earlier put it this way. He said, every single day I learn something new or figure something out and think, why didn't I think of that 10 years ago? But having knowledge doesn't really mean anything if you don't share it. That's a repair shop. What if we in the church figured that one out. I recently heard a message about how the church is making more fans than followers of Christ. Quoting an unknown author, the pastor read something that struck me to the core of my being. It is possible today for a person to come into the cultural pattern of the church without having met the head of the church, Jesus Christ. This is disastrous beyond description. We have been so afraid we might lose potential members that we have been willing to take them on their own terms. And then we wonder why the church is relatively impotent and doesn't have the power to transform human life, to shake society to its very roots. Notice I didn't say that you, don't, you do take people as they are, but you don't take people on their own terms. We follow, we take people on Jesus' terms. The image, though, of the church shaking society to its very roots shook me. And friends, we, the church, are capable of doing that, just doing that. If we'll be like John or John or Andrew or Philip or Nathaniel or the multitude of others who put Jesus first and foremost. If we simply do what he wanted and believe it's what we were created to do. It happened then, it can happen now. If God's desires, methods, and agenda are more important than what people want, it can happen if we follow with simple childlike trust and faith rather than following our own convoluted human reasoning and our skepticism and our fear. It can happen if we'll invite people to come and see Jesus, not come into a cultural pattern, a program, or a show. A good friend shared a quote the other day I can't stop thinking about either. It goes, Christ plus nothing equals everything. You know, Christianity seems to be getting so complicated these days. We have to do this and we have to do that in order for people to even walk in your doors or for people to come to Christ. Friends, Christ plus nothing equals everything. And everything without Christ is nothing. 
Jesus first and foremost, with nothing else added, means the world to us as his followers. And the world without him first and foremost means absolutely nothing. It is as simple as that. Jesus wanted to go to Galilee where he found Philip and said, follow me. Jesus wants to come to Brooklyn Center or he wants to come to wherever you go to church and he finds us and he says simply, follow me. Just imagine what kind of impact we could make on another person's life if they actually thought we were Jesus' grandpa or grandma because we talk about him all the time, openly, with pride, and with so much love that we can't contain ourselves. I pray that we'd be a people who put and keep Jesus first and foremost always. And I also pray that we would want what he wants. Amen.